All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. I, I had no idea that so many people would be interested in the rail trail, but I think it is a timely subject, and I'm very glad to see so many people are here. Um, now, how many of you have been out walking on the trail? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Okay. Now, <laughs> uh, my name is Joanne Halbert. I'm a member of the Holliston Historical Society and uh, also a resident of Mudville, which uh, the real trail is one of our best kept secrets there. Don't want to give it away. <laughs> but, uh, and I have a high appreciation for the rail trail and we're very glad to be able to talk about it today. But first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little time travel here, everybody. Now just think that you're living in Holliston in 1830 and you're planning a trip to Boston. How would you get there? What kind of a trip would it be? How long would it take you? What kind of an ordeal would be presented to you? Now, what kind of transportation was in this particular area? Now, the only new form of transportation anywhere nearby would be the Blackstone Canal, which ran from Worcester to Providence. And that was in 1824. It was a new innovation, a new way to travel one place to the other, mostly uh, for goods and services. But how would you get to Boston? Either walk or take a horse. <laughs> yeah, you, don't you think so? Yes. And the thing is that it was a rather large and long ordeal that you would have to go through in order to go. Now, Holliston had a, a rather unique geographic uh, uh, position on where we were because we're somewhat equidistant from Boston, Worcester, and also Providence. And we had dealings and uh, trips in all three of those directions. As a matter of fact, back in the 1700s, Ariel Bragg, who was creating the first shoe industry in Holliston, um, when he packed up his first bunch of shoes and boots that he was going to take to sell, which direction do you think he went? He had three choices. Which one did he go in? He went to Providence. So th we're telling ourselves that, hey, Providence was rather important in Holliston's industrial early history. But we did make trips to Boston. One uh, product that we would take back then would be the pine trees that you see all around Holliston. They were used for ship masts right up until the time that we stopped making those large three masters in Boston and elsewhere. But it was one product that went that way. But we had a lot of other industries here too. And what you would have to do is pack them up onto a wagon and head down the road. Now, what is really interesting um, that we found out about was that in 1841, there was um, what was called the mail route number 412. Now, this may sound very familiar to you, and they mapped it out and announced it in the paper. So the mail route 412 ran like this, from Boston to Brighton to Newton to West Newton, Newton Lower Falls. West Needham, you know where West Needham is now? Wellesley, but it was not known as that in 1841. On to South Natick, Sherbin, Holliston, Milford, Menden, ending up in Uxbridge, a distance of 40 miles and back three times a week. So you could hitch up, it, they would send out a coach Four horses, you could also catch a ride on that too, going back and forth. But listening to all of those stops along the way, what do we know that route as now? Route 16, it is the same road. So that was our road in and out of Holliston. And that's what it was like in 1830. So you would plan your trip to Boston. And very likely what you would do is that you would catch that stagecoach and head in. It would be an all-day trip. So you would have to make plans to stay over in Boston and come back the next day. And sometimes if you want to catch the early coach, you'd come down into downtown Holliston if you were out on an outlying farm, and you would settle in at the Hollis House Hotel and wait for the stage because, after all, it wasn't running really on time all the time, and you never really knew exactly when it was going to show up. So trips had a little bit of a... Uh, a, a mystique about travel that uh, we don't have today. So if you wanted to follow a schedule, well, you're going to have to be very flexible when it came to that. 
But now new ideas and new ways of travel were coming in. In 1835, the railway from Boston to Worcester was finally finished and constructed, and there was a big celebration in 1835, on July 4th, and that is a key date, in order to celebrate that. Now, that was built after the, the, uh, the canal was done from Worcester to Providence, which tied those two industrially and transportation-wide. And then they started to get a little bit worried that everything was going to go in that direction from the middle of the state. And so they constructed that train line, the railway that went Boston and Worcester in order to compete for some of that um, industrial, uh, uh, the wealth that would be coming out of the state. So once that happened, though, in 1835, what happened was that everybody got into the business of putting out bonds in order to construct the railway spurs that went off of that main line. And one of those spurs was the old railway that we know in Holliston that went from Framingham to Milford. Now, not everybody was really happy about this because they were proposing, and just imagine this, they were proposing that that railway that we were going to have out of Framingham and down to Milford might also give us the opportunity to do a railway that went all the way from Boston to Framingham and down towards Milford and then beyond all the way to New York City. Now, there is a line that we know about, and I'm sure that some of you have taken Amtrak, which did finally get that line. And people were very worried over in Norfolk County that we were going to end up with that. And so they, get, they made a big push to make sure that we did not get that line. But can you imagine that we would have Amtrak coming through Holliston on that line uh, if it had gone through? But no, Norfolk County pushed it through. It was called the Air Line in the airline because it would have gone all the way uh, continuously from Boston all the way to New York City, which was not the case back in the 1830s and 40s. So Holliston did get its line though, but there was another proposal that would have put that spur line starting at what was uh, then known at that time as Unionville, we now know it as Ashland. And the spur would go off from there, follow a line roughly, as we know, on Highland Street, and then it would go out to Milford. And that certainly didn't sit well with downtown Holliston, because after all, most of our industry was located in that area. So somebody put in a little bug into the ear of the, uh, the group that was putting this together and said, hey, that's not really too practical if we have it way out there and when we got all the industry right down here in the middle of Holliston. So they made an adjustment and they came down from Framingham through part of Sherbin into Holliston, ending up in Milford. Now what happens when you get to Milford? You would have to get off that line. Eventually Old Colony Railroad would create a line that would go up to Milford, but in order to get over there, you would have to walk across the street to get onto a new line. All of these lines were highly protected by the people who owned them, and so you didn't have very much interconnectability at the time. So that, that was really, really a tough thing. But now, Holliston was getting its line, and work started in earnest in order to get it together. Now, coming down from Framingham was not all that bad. They didn't run into too many problems. A little bit of bear swamp, as they called it. Uh, the grade was fine. They could get down to East Holliston fairly easily. And then the next segment, of course, is the one that we know from what we know as Washington Street, right down to the center of Holliston. And of course, that gives us one of our great landmarks, the Eight Arch Bridge which you will hear a lot more about as this, this uh, presentation goes on. Why that eight arch bridge? Why did they fill it in and just make it a grade there and we wouldn't have that lovely eight arch bridge? We'll hear more about that later. So we get down to downtown Holliston, 1847, and they have a celebration in Holliston on July 4th. 
seems to be a very important date when you come to railroads and getting to finished products. And it was a wonderful thing. We were able to go back and forth on that line at least to get things going as far as Hollison was concerned. But of course, we are going to go on to more railroad down to Milford. Now we have that lovely eight arch bridge and it was talked about uh, in the reports that came out in the Boston papers. But they also talked a great deal about another part of, the, of this railroad that really caught the eye of people. And this has to do with the increase on the grade that was from about Central Street all the way to what we know as the Highland Street Tunnel. And everybody was quite impressed with that. And that's probably one part of the walk that you might not realize is worth taking the time to do this, to walk from Central Street all the way to the tunnel and then notice how high that grade is. You're up amongst the trees when you do that. And that was done from 1847 to 1848. It was the toughest part of the project, they said. And it is the, quite the most impressive. Now imagine, what kind of equipment do you think that they would use in order to get that grade? Did they have bulldozers? Did they have steam shovels? Steam shovel, I believe. Yes, that's right. There were, there were a lot of picks and shovels that were handled by a large group of workers, hundreds of them. And many of them were of Irish descent because as you know, in the 1840s, there was a large uh, upsurge of immigration from Ireland and those types of jobs were handed out to the immigrants coming in. That is why we have a very strong Irish heritage in Holliston and especially in Mudville where every house in there had an Irish name attached to it. And many of those houses ended up in that spot because of the fact that they had a very tough, challenging time building that end of the railroad to go and, and increase that grade so that the, the, the trains could run along it. You, after all, you can't go on hills. And to break through the ledge that is Highland Street. And the, there was a lot of ledge along there. So it was very, very difficult and very challenging to get through there. Once they got through it, though, it was almost clear sailing to Milford, almost. Now, of course, they would be working from the other end, too, coming up from Milford. But they had it a lot easier coming from that direction than we had from downtown Holliston to about Summer Street uh, in, in our town. But they made it. They broke through, and we have several marvelous landmarks along the way, not only the Eight Arch Bridge, the railroad tunnel, which we have incorporated into some celebrations, especially on uh, New Year's Eve, which is a wonderful spot, and also the increase in grade all the way along the way. And notice that next time that you're out and realize what it took, all these picks and axe, axe cuts that were made by the people who came through to put this railroad through. Uh, it is quite an engineering marvel when you look at it. Remember. No steam shovels, no bulldozers, and it was all just carting dirt and raising the grate in order to get all the way to Milford. Now, of course, they ran into a few little impasses along the way as well as far as um, uh, citizens. Herman Leland had a farm that was located right about where the depot on Railroad Street is now located. And the engineers came to Herman and said, hey, Mr. Leland, you know what? The train is going to be coming right through where your barn is. <laughs> <laughs> and he answered, well, I sure hope you don't expect me to open, and door the, open the barn door every time a train comes through. <laughs> yeah. What happened was that they would buy up by eminent domain. There were two houses, one on Railroad Street and one that is on Union Street, and they're back to back. These were the corporation houses. They were, uh, they were bought out. They were set up there. One of them was moved. The very large pinkish colored uh, colonial that you see on Union Street was actually moved from up at that location down to Union Street. This was where they would house workers along the line. 
so that you would uh, not have to uh, you know, go all the way back, all the way back to Framingham, for heaven's sakes. But, but those two houses are still in existence. Corporation houses, now private residences, of course, as they once were uh, back at that time. So poor Herman lost out on the eminent domain. I just only hope that he got uh, his compensation was equal to what he felt was, was uh, agreeable. So once the train started to come through, there was great improvement and there was great um, uh, increase in Hollison's in industries. At the time, of course, we had boots and shoes going on. We also had a whole lot of straw hats being made. We also had several other uh, uh, harness makers, for instance. And all of our products could be shipped out as far away as New York now, instead of just only to Boston, Worcester, or Providence, Rhode Island. So uh, increase in the last half of the 19th century was great. A few little bumps along the road, such as the Civil War, which kind of put a damper on um, our shoe industry because many of our products were going to the, um, the South and the West, uh, which was, of course, interrupted by the Civil War. But we did start up afterwards. Ha uh, straw hats continued to be a big product in Hollis. It was our second most important industry uh, until imports kind of put an end to that in the 1890s. So beyond that, um, I do want to pass this along to our next speaker to take us beyond the construction and the history of the trail uh, will be coming up next. So, dun -dun -dun. <laughs> there. All right. So now we're yes. more modern times. More modern times, yes. <laughs> Okay. And, uh, let's see. I'm Robert Widenick from the Trails Committee, yes. and what I'll be talking about is, you know, the brief history of the rail trail. Okay, the conversion of the railroad to the rail trail itself, the status of the improvements, just to let people be up to date on it. Some of the points of interest is I saw all the hands seem to be up. There may be some, you know, unique features, especially some of the historic structures along the way. Some yes. people may not know about. I'll point that out and talk about the funding, construction, and some just a quick uh, before and after photographs of the site. This is a regional trail map. The Holliston is in the thick, bold line, and the upper the railroad actually came from Framingham, the T station, came down through Sherburn, through Holliston, and Milford. Well, the Upper Charles Trail is planned to be two different railroads. There was another railroad that ran from Milford. Um, up into Hopkinton, and then a third railroad that ran from Hopkinton over into uh, Framingham. So the, uh, the goal was to have this uh, loop trail. Uh, there's a, quite a bit of issues associated with some of the land in Ashland and Hopkinton, where a lot of those railroad corridor uh, was sold off. Uh, but what we'll be talking about here is the, what is basically the Holliston 6.7 miles that runs through town. Um, the first, I, I tried to go through some of the old history. Um, it was actually before I moved into town. Um, there was a, the first I saw any evidence of the uh, rail trail uh, being thought about was about 1986. It may have been before that, but that's the only evidence that I've been able to find um, that there was some interest. And in as part of the town has an open space and recreation plan, at that time they were talking about the goal of converting what was then abandoned was from Cross Street we were the Phillips 66 gas station is all the way to the Milford line. And so that line was only, uh, let's see, that would be three and a half miles or so. Um, that was the only piece that was abandoned at that time. And so that they were talking about uh, in the 80, 1986 open space plan to uh, make that into a bike trail. That was uh, obviously before I moved into town and um, later on. Um, and then um, I work for an engineering company, and John Thomas, who was also with what is called the Upper Charles uh, Conservation Land Trust, Inc., um, got the idea of why don't we look at a larger plan, not just this small segment that goes from Cross Street to the Milford Line. Let's see if we can try to make all that connection that I was pointing to, uh, which is on that big map, same thing there, you know, this three different railroad lines. So John Thomas came up with the idea of c making it a regional loop trail, 26 miles, uh, connecting all the way to Framingham. And so at that time, we started 
Uh, I was working with John, and so I did some of the early uh, concept designs uh, enough to get some of the funding. So we went through what was then the IST funding, I-S-T-E-A funding, to get the funding for the construction of a two-mile segment of it in 1997. Quickly, uh, soon thereafter, in 1998, CSX took over the railroad uh, from Conrail, and they said, we're not going to give you that two miles of land. We're going to sell it to you. And, and right away, we're not going to talk to you for at least three years. Uh, there was a convoluted agreement that they had had. Um, and so it took us uh, 14 years to finally talk to CSX through. We, we were doing appraisals. They were doing appraisals. We did a third-party appraisal. It took us basically 14 years, and I had eight different project managers at CSX that I was dealing with to finally convince them to sell it to us. So during that time, we lost that mass DOT funding. So we said, all right, to get back on the funding, they're, they're still talking 2023 before the first phase would be able to be built if we went through the mass DOT and the ICE-T funding. So we said, let's you know, come up with a different alternative. So we then uh, went through more with the volunteer effort and short money through a recreational trails grant uh, to be able to build uh, sections of the trail. We didn't have enough money any one year to buy and to build um, you know, the full 6.7 miles, so we did it little piece as we, we went along. So we basically did the low-cost alternative, and it's, it's actually fairly comical because we could build the stone dust surfaces. We've got it down to about $50,000 per mile. That's with the gravel, the stone dust, the contractors we have to hire for all that. And, and to put that all together. So that's $50,000 a mile. When you go through the mass DOT process, they're now talking about $2 million a mile, but that's for the paved alternative. But you know, just the process and the time, years in the making. You know, so you know, we, went, we opted to go the, the uh, quicker alternative. So, so far we've, we've completed eight, uh, six and a half miles of stone dust surfaces. We've had great help with uh, scouts and volunteers to put up railings at a number of the bridges. We have five of the bridges that are just done. Two bridges were done in the last month um, by e Eagle Scout projects. Uh, we've had landscape pro improvements both by volunteers, um, uh, 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 scouts. Uh, Blair Square Park sort of uh, came overnight one night when Bobby Blair came out and <laughs> talked to us about <laughs> What are you going to do down here? It's a mess, you know. And so <laughs> next day we were out there with chainsaws and, and started cutting down some of the trees. Um, and then we've done some other amenities, some benches and some signage as we went along. Um, what's yet to be done, and uh, Jay Robinson, who's on a separate committee, which is the Eight Arch Bridge Committee, will talk a little bit more about, you know, the, uh, the, the restoration of the Eight Arch Bridge and the putting of uh, the railings on the top of that. Um, we have other things to do. Is, uh, we have, we've ar already purchased the rapid flashing beacons. If you're familiar with the, the Summer Street, um, you press the button and it flashes. We have, we have purchased three more of those. They are yet to be installed, uh, hopefully uh, in the spring. Whoops, I went too fast. Um, we have more railings to be installed. Um, whistle posts, I don't know if you've seen them along the way. I have photographs of them later. Um, but those whistle posts told, told the engineer where to blow the whistle when they were coming to an intersection. Um, it, but as some people have seen some of the obvious uh, points of interest along the trail, but there's the Eight Arch Bridge, the Phipps Tunnel at Highland Street. There are four, if you don't know this, there are four single arch bridges. One of them is actually buried, and it's over closest to South Street. And when they reoriented South Street, I think, uh, correct the time, maybe in the uh, 50s or so. They relocated South Street and uh, they actually just physically just buried the, the arch, you know, the bridge that was once there. And you could, you could find it now if you, if you look for it. But um, there were two train stations that still exist in town. One is a private residence at Washington Street and obviously Casey's Pub. Uh, there were two other stations, one at Summer Street um, the Metcalf station, and then a, another one was down by Bragville. Those are long gone. I think they, I don't know if they burned them or tore them down or whatever. Um, but there are numerous cattle passes along the way. And back when Holliston was mainly agricultural lands, they would force the, the cattle, probably sheep, I would say, to go. There were fences all along there, and they would have the fences lead up to a, a it was only like three and a half foot high by a couple feet wide, uh, cattle passes, and so some of those are now where we're putting the railings. 
um, uh, to, uh, for safety reasons. And the whistle posts I had mentioned, uh, there are two granite mile markers. Every marker that you see, there are only two of them left, but every mile there would be a granite mar marker would say B for Boston and then the distance that we are from the Boston going through Framingham and over. So we'll, you'll see 24, 26, and, and so forth uh, along the way. Uh, but there's a, you know, the Mudville area, obviously you're f familiar with that area and the history that has. There were cranberries that were very famous and cranberries were mainly at the, uh, at the, at the far end there was a cranberry bog. They used to ship them, I guess, to town hall yes. and then sort them and then put them on a train and take them in. Um, the pink granite line, there was a lot of pink granite that was taken from the Milford quarries, brought out along, along the uh, rail bed itself. Uh, there's the uh, Pout Lane, which is a Native American walkway that goes over by Wenakeening Woods. Uh, uh, so, so these are some of the interests. So these are the four different arches. One's at Arch Street. Are you familiar with that one? This one is out by Hoppingbrook uh, Road. I'm sorry, no, this is the one. Yeah, this, this is by Chicken Brook. This is Hoppingbrook Road, and this, this is part of the buried one. This is all that you can see if you go to the north side of the buried bridge over by South Street. There's the mile markers that I was telling you about, the whistle post, we're in the process of restoring them. The marking was you know, a white panel with a black uh, line. That's the best evidence we had on there. There's some beautiful drainage channels. Look at the shape of that, that's over uh, the Winthrop Canal. Uh, another whistle post along the way. And then every once in a while you'll see, I can't see myself, there's a flag here, a black metal flag. I, can't even tell where it is, but looking at it from this angle. Um, but uh, you'll see these remnants of, of the railroad. Um, like I said, we did a lot of the funding. We didn't go through the Mass DOT. We uh, asked our legislators, got us some funding. We've used some CPC, Community Preservation Funds, um, to do uh, one is to purchase the land, and then Jay will talk about the, uh, the uh, Eight Arch Bridge. We've done a lot of volunteer with the Friends of uh, Hollis and Trails has done some fundraising. Mary had a uh, fundraising uh, activities for the Eight Arch Bridge as well, and then a whole, numerous other uh, locations. But it's done w with a lot of volunteer help. We have over 7,000 hours now of volunteer assistance with all different types of groups, you know, and, and maintaining the trail, cutting the trail, putting in landscape improvements, building railings, those sort of things. That's actually the physical labor that we've had along there. And I mentioned the, some of the improvements you see from Bobby Blair at the Blair Square area. Um, we've had scouts install some of the stop signs. And then I'll just walk you through uh, quickly, you know, some of the before and after. This is Arch Street area. Uh, obviously before the railing, it, would, it was significant drop off there and, and it was uh, pretty dangerous. But people have been going there since 1850, walking across that bridge uh, along that grading, even when the railroad was active. Um, we've now since uh, put those. Um, these are some of the early shots of, of the rail bed surface itself. It was very hummocky for the dirt bike and quad activities. Along the trail, we smoothed that out with uh, construction construction equipment and then put down the stone dust surface. Again, you know, lots of drainage issues along the way that we had to resolve. We even uh, uh, got the mosquito control project to come in and dig the channels in order to help uh, drain it better. And, and I joke about it now, but this is the, we put in this uh, perforated pipe within the, uh, the, the tunnel and that's the first time that I've seen the, the tunnel dry. And I joke that it's the first time it's been dry since 1847. <laughs> this is Blair Square. This is the Bobby Blair the day after he was reporting on the lions doing a cleanup. And the next day we were out there cutting it. But you can see the activities from that. And I'll turn it over to Jay who will talk about the Eight Arch Bridge itself. Uh, thanks for coming. And uh, I want to start with thanks for your support for this project. Um, one thing that I just want to make sure is clear is like with the CPC funding, I think of that as like your 401k for investing in infrastructure. So all this money uh, to do this project came from the CPC. And uh, I'm going to get some of this right, some of this wrong, but Mary's team was the predecessor to the town sanctioned Eight Arch Bridge Committee. So it's really confusing because Mary was on the original Eight Arch Bridge committee. So what we did is we started with 
the report that they put together working with Gill Engineering. And um, I'm the only non-engineer. I'm the sheep herder on the project, okay? So um, we looked at the design because, as you saw, the, it's designed to hold a train. And we said to ourselves, well, we're not going to design it to hold a train, right? We're going to rehab the bridge. And that kind of lowered some of the uh, specifications that you would need and, and would translate to money, right? So, um, and then um, Robert was talking about mass DOT. We, we didn't want to get into, we didn't want to turn this into a mass DOT project. So there's a lot of people behind the scenes that helped us uh, get this thing started. And obviously, you, you folks had to approve it, right? We, we needed the money from, from you. Everything's a vote. So I want to start with thank you for your trust um, to, to do this project. And hopefully, you're happy with the end result and the product. So I'm sorry. So what I'm going to do is kind of go through the process. Quick raise of hands. Did, did anyone watch the Selectman's meeting? Because I'm reusing the deck from the Selectman's meeting. If you re watched it, can you raise your hand so I don't bore you? <laughs> All right. I won't tell the selectmen, so they didn't see, no one in the audience saw it. They said most, most everyone's hands were raised, so, uh, so, all right, let's get into it. Okay, so I actually presented this slide deck at town, and, you know, you saw what Robert's done with uh, the rail trail, and his team has done with the rail trail committee. There's a lot of steps to it. So there's a lot that we went through, but we're basically, our target date is May 31st to be complete. And uh, Mary could speak to this some celebration ideas for July 4th. But, but here's where we're at, okay? Uh, and this slide deck is actually available on the town website. So, um, okay. So this slide should look familiar. This is the bridge. This is actually a mock-up that we borrowed from, from Mary's team. And this was kind of our starting point, right? You've got people, not trains. Um, we said to ourselves, we're not going to, because um, Mary's told me, I've heard it a few times, about the efflorescence and how, how much of it there is and how, you know, you, you get a chisel and it's about a foot deep. That wasn't our job to beautify the bridge. It was to fix this and put railings on it, to oversimplify it, okay? There were drainage issues with the current design. There were, and keep me honest if I use the wrong terms, scuppers, right, the tubes. So these tubes, as you run along the bridge, that got clogged like your gutters, Okay, so obviously water's got to go somewhere. So it was finding any crack. And it's not like the bridge was going to drop in, like a clear and present danger. But eventually, like this jewel would, would be damaged. So we took the spec from uh, round one of Gill Engineering and said to ourselves, let's make a sidewalk for the bridge, put railings on it, and design it so that imagine a roof, right, without gutters that overhangs and the water runs off like to me that's like the bottom line of what we're doing to the bridge there's a bridge in newton called the echo bridge um you know like may, we're not newton but our bridge is going to look a lot nicer they got chain link fence running along not these beautiful railings but the same concept it's like an aqueduct with a, a flat top a pitch top and the water just runs off so we're not reinventing the wheel and uh, i think from uh working with kim sullivan on the historical commission Paul from the Historical Society. Uh, I, I think everyone, you know, kind of, we got blessing up front, so we didn't do something, then all the experts in town say, what did you do to the, to the crown jewel? Okay, so uh, I'm going to walk through really high level what we did for the project. And I want to start with, these are not the railings. <laughs> okay, there are people that are posting on Facebook or asking, or on the Halston Reporter, like, Oh my God, whose idea was it to put these railings in? These are not the railings, okay? Um, we have a firm, NEL Engineering, they're doing a, they did the bridge in Framingham. Um, it's uh, the bridge that connects you to Keefe Tech. They're doing work on the Mass Pike. They are very safety conscious. They're, we were really lucky to get that firm. They're not like a you know, small mom and pop shop. They, they do this for a living. So what this is, uh, where's the beeper on this, this green thing? There we go, okay. So. What this is, is basically catching. So you've got a tarp here to protect the wetlands. And then you've got this, because they got to chip away, which I'll go through, concrete. And the other thing is, these guys need to uh, be able to walk up and along the bridge, right? And we don't want them to fall off. The, the other thing is, and what, what they told me is, they use plywood instead of just uh, clear, because, you know, they're like, all right, we don't, ask, we don't want people asking a million questions while we're doing this, right? <laughs> so 
<laughs> Unfortunately, everyone thought this was the, the railings. Okay, so this is for safety. We got a top-notch crew. You know, like, there's, there's a waterway there. They made a, a bridge there. Like, so this was run like a highly engineered project. And um, Gill Engineering, same thing. The guy that was the project manager for Gill Engineering um, was, like, one of the what's, – what's his title when he worked for the state? He was, like, the Southeast – district coordinator and so we had some some fun working with dan on the project We're like oh my god dan like come on let's get moving this isn't you know this isn't the big dig like why are you doing everything by the book and what i found out is dan wrote the book <laughs> okay dan wrote the book so we've been really lucky so far with this engineering project which sounds like i'm just i told you oh all we're doing is putting a sidewalk on it and putting some railings easy peasy should take a week there's a lot that goes into it. I'm not going to put you to sleep. It's already hot enough in here. Okay? So this is kind of the overview from the way I understand it. The experts would uh, would probably shrivel or, you know, be like, oh, my God, why is he using these terms? But so first thing they did is from, from a safety perspective, they made harnesses here to protect the guys. There's the other side of it. They have to cut these things off, the wings, right? They got to prep the bridge. This used to be gravel, right? So, like, when you look here, this to the bottom of the gravel was a couple feet. This was like probably two and a half, three feet when they scrape all the gravel off. And they put it here, and they put it down here on the other side of the bridge, okay? So the first thing they had to do is prep the bridge. There's a lot of work to prep the bridge, okay? So they're the wings. So they cut this off, right? And see these little orange lines? That's a cut mark. Boom, 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 boom. And then you get this. And someone in the selectman's meeting said Bobby Blair is going to auction these off. <laughs> They're going to go really quick, so uh, pay attention, all right? So these are the wings. Okay. Then, so let me go back from it here. So you see this, and it's kind of wavy. You know, it's, it's concrete. It's not perfect. So then they had to do some, some concrete work because what they're going to do, which I'll show you. Remember this step. It's important because they're going to basically put these concrete slabs on top of the bridge, right? And it's got to be level. So they had to prep the service. A lot of prep work. And they started early because we had a mild winter. So, you know, the gods were smiling on us for this project. Okay? They needed to set a crane. We got these big slabs, right? Um, they, got a, they were going to use a crane. I'll show you a video next. And some of the things we learned is, like, they had to go a lot deeper than they thought because they tested the soil, and it didn't hold as much weight as they thought. It should sound familiar. Like, this didn't turn into Holliston's big dig, but it, but it could have. So... So they had to go deeper. They had to make sure the crane was safe. The biggest thing we said to these guys is um, make sure, you know, no one gets hurt on this gig, right? So they set the crane. Then one of the th things we said, the committee said, um, so we have um, Allison, who's a structural engineer, Dennis, who works for one of the major engineering firms, uh, Herb, who's a landscape engineer and works with uh, Robert and team on, like, just, just general smart guy, and Paul Sonny, a civil engineer. So where they landed was, instead of, like, pouring concrete on site, let's use, so you see this United, it's, I think it's United Concrete. They're a mass DOT certified vendor. So what we did is we said we're going to build, it's like a Lego project. They're going to make these in a mass DOT factory, right, lots of controls, and we're going to have them just drop them one at a time onto the bridge. And then you'll notice that the, this rebar, it kind of interconnects, right? So it, it looks like this in layman's terms. So it's kind of like we're putting Legos on the bridge. Pretty cool, huh, bud? Legos, right? You got Legos? All right. So, so the first thing they did is they stage them. They drop them on the bridge. The other thing is with this picture, it's a little blurry. There's like a measuring dude here. They, a lot of measurements. So the first slab took them about almost a day to put down. They needed to, like, practice. So this was, you know, like I said, you just build a sidewalk and railings on a bridge. But it was a little bit unique because they wanted to put the crane here. And we're like, nope, that's out of bounds. There's wetlands on this side. By the way, you got to put the crane here. And the bridge span is 200 feet, right? So you start doing the math, and you got this big crane holding a slab. Imagine taking a 10-pound weight and holding it here. You're fine. You hold it here. You're fine. Now try holding it out here and see what happens. So they had to hit it. They had to hit it from two sides. So all that engineering for like making sure the crane doesn't tip over, they had to do here, and then they had to do here. So a lot of measuring. Because the other thing is, um, they put this one in the middle, right? So you know, my home improvement projects. If I'm an inch and off, no big deal, right? No big deal. If you're on a 200 foot span and you're an inch off, 
it's going to get ugly really quick by the time you get to the end. So HCAT has, um, has a video on this. Uh, I'm sure the folks at the library, if you don't have a computer or you know, need some help, they could help you. It's pretty cool to watch. So basically what happens is you got this crane. It looks like a big crane. It's fully, it's fully extended. So what happens is this is like your staging area. It's picking those precasts up, taking them up over the trees. This thing is like fully extended in the video. It goes all the way up, right? And then, so if this is, if this is the trail, right, it's got to pick it all the way up. And then it's got to swing. So this area, this area has to be pretty, you know, this thing has to be pretty stable because it's going to swing. And then it's going to slowly drop it onto the, uh, onto the bridge. And uh, it was pretty interesting because you see this big slab and you see these two guys and it comes down to them and one's on each side of the, you know, the wooden railings, right? And they, they by hand, grab the slab and, and help level it. So um, definitely check out this video. It's pretty cool. Uh, and it's in a couple different places. Okay, so this is what it looked like from one side, you know, you know, step, 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 step. Um, and then obviously they went to the other side. So, all right. All right, so the other thing is, remember when I told you before when they went to prep the bridge, there was like a concrete piece, and I said, remember that piece? So what they did is not only did they put that piece in, but these uh, Lego pegs help level the bridge. So they're like screws. So obviously the bridge is not perfect. It's a couple hundred year old bridge. So they use these screws to level the uh, slabs. Okay. So again, it's like, you know, oh, just put a sidewalk and railings on. I think there's some pretty slick engineering here. So they level the bridge, right, with these little screws here. And then they shoot um, non-shrink grout cement underneath the bridge. Because the last thing we want is water getting trapped under the bridge. It's like ground, and then we're like groundhog day. We're back to, oh my God, what, what, why do we do this? Um, so what they do is they get a hose and they literally shoot concrete and they just watch it flow. And they watch it flow through these holes. Um, some of these holes create, um, make it so that air, like air has a place to escape. And it looks like this. Okay. Um, the last piece, our committee asked a lot of questions to the engineering firm and it helped clarify for me, is then they're going to put like a, some type of strip over here, because there's like a one inch gap here, okay? And it's gonna go, that one inch strip is gonna go all the way like this. And then they put in, um, it's like some type of sealant that they use on most highway projects. So what will happen is when it rains, the water will go here, it crowns and it just runs off. So those scuppers, right, the, the gutters, we didn't wanna do scuppers. We wanted to keep it simple, let gravity and mother nature do most of the lifting. Okay, okay. The other thing is the end of the bridge, the end post forms are uh, poured concrete. And that's where we actually paid somebody to stand there and watch concrete dry, right? <laughs> Can't make this up. I went out there and I'm like, guy smoking a cigarette. I'm like, who are you? And he's like, I'm the grout inspector. But, um, <laughs> but he earned his money because the first batch of grout that showed up uh, they talk about like in the big dig slurry or whatever. It didn't, it was too thick, so it wouldn't run. And he said, send it back. So, so that's the end post. Those are what the real railings look like, okay? And they look pretty close to the rendering. So these are going to be, this is like a rough, uh, rough draft of it. It'll obviously be black. It'll be ga uh, powder coated, so it won't rust as quick. We, one of the, um, guiding principles for this project was to design the bridge in a way where there's low maintenance. I mean, Robert and his team, the DPW, have enough work in their hands. So these uh, railings are uh, pretty slick. The other thing is, uh, some of the things I learned is uh, Mass DOT uh, does not like railings that go like this. And um, Peter Tartikoff does not like railings that go like this. <laughs> Because they're like, it's like climbing a ladder. It's like kids will climb it and jump off the bridge. So this design was, was kind of, a, it, it adhered to the, to the vision that Mary's team said, which is this is how we want the bridge to look like. But we did it in a way where Peter's happy and we, you know, Mass DOT's happy. Okay. Um, yeah, so here we go. Just for the record, Holliston Building, Inspector Rail Standards. I think I have an email from Peter, so he's on the hook. Um, here's what's left. So 
finishing up that grouting, sealing the joints, completion of the end posts, the rail installation, literally the concrete has school, uh, screw holes. So as long as they set the precast right, that 200 foot long section of railing should just screw right in, easy peasy. Uh, trail regrading, that's where um, we're blessed to have the volunteers like Herb. Uh, Herb Brockert's on point to work with the engineering firm because they had to dig, right, to put the crane in. So there's some trail re regrading and project closeout. Target date is May 31st, okay? And then um, I'm not going to go through this, but for anyone that's really uh, having trouble sleeping at night, there's some diagrams here that shows you the engineering behind it. And the, the last thing is you've got these end posts. One pretty cool design I thought was at first I thought there was going to be, you know, it's just like a tube. You just go right into the bridge. But they designed it to, like, open up to a funnel. So hopefully the people that will not be riding their dirt bikes on this bridge anymore if they uh, zig instead of zag, they won't get impaled. Like, it brings you into the bridge. So it's a pretty slick design overall. So any questions, comments? Yeah, question. Go ahead. Question. How much does each of those slabs weigh, you know? And also, did they bring in that um, crane from the access point behind the depot? So the slabs weigh about, I think, 3,400 pounds. Because they were debating, can they? They were at first thinking, OK, maybe we could use a bobcat pick it up and drive it out on the bridge. And the bobcat guy looked at how narrow the bridge is and was like, mm, I don't think so, I'm not going to do that. Um, so they're about 3,400 pounds, and that came into the math of the crane could only like drop a uh, section so far. And your other question was, um, sorry. The access for the crane itself, I'm, I'm assuming they drove it in from the access point behind the depot liquor store and drove it all the way down. They, I think they came in uh, near the Holliston Oil on one side, and on the other side, Lowland Street. They just come right in. It's pretty slick. Good. Good questions. Anyone else? All right. Great. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Right. Cool. I, have I have to thank Jay personally because when I um, handed off the ad hoc committee, that was the original one that started raising money and and our goal was to raise enough money, seed money, to get the engineering, the initial engineering, was the bridge structurally sound and worth saving? We wanted that, and we also wanted to get some visibility, and because we knew that eventually it would have to go through town meeting. So that's what our little committee did, and then Jay and I had the pleasure of serving on a different committee, I can't even remember what it was, and I noticed how really, really clever this guy was. Mm -hmm. And so I suggested that it would be a great thing if he got involved in the official committee because I just thought he could corral sheep very well and he did you did a fabulous job you really really did and I mean that so anyway I never have to worry about doing that kind of thing again I can just call Jay anyway so <laughs> oh gosh now come on you guys with all okay there we go okay so trains trails and prosperity we've already listened to Joanne to, uh, to talk about you know in the beginning. Well, in the way, way, way back, in the 1700s, the 1600s, we were all relatively self-sufficient people. You know, we had mills all over the place. These are different brooks that we have in town, one over in, on Woodland Street, the Queens, Linden Pond. These are places where we had mills, and we used them for our own use. It wasn't that we were selling product and taking it anywhere. We had cooper shops and hammers and sides and all the rest of it things that we needed to have to live every single day. So our early settlers here in Holliston were doing what all early settlers were doing. They were living and they were surviving. We were a farming community and it was the women who typically took product from the agricultural products that were grown and slugged on into Boston. And they would go to the Boston Common using their carts or maybe some of them didn't even have carts, I don't know. These were tough times. In the middle of the 1700s, there was a huge outbreak of, of a disease, and half the population died. Then you had wars, and, you know, it was just survival. And then there was the start of a, of a what I ended up calling a, a, an evolution, an industrial evolution rather than a revolution, and that was when Ariel Bragg started making shoes here in the west end of town where, where it's called Braggville. And uh, there is a little Bragg uh, Cemetery out there that is a really sweet little area to, to go and take pictures, especially if you're into old cemeteries. And what he did was he started 
schlepping around, and as Joanne said, he went down to Providence. Well, now all of a sudden we were <coughs> excuse me, taking product out of town. We were making something that was going someplace else. He created and, and got a whole lot of people working. Families, they built little shoe shops in the back of their yards. And when we're walking on this trail and we see these tiny little buildings that look pretty old, um, they often were these little boot shops where families would do piecemeal work. They might just put the sole on, they might put the holes in them, whatever. But families participated. There's one of these that was moved over to the Historical Society and is on the grounds there. What do we use it as at the Historical Society? Tomorrow it begins a uh, one-room schoolhouse for 18th century. It's 18th century days. They turn it into the schoolhouse. And that go in there, sneak in tomorrow when all the kids are there. It's really kind of fun. <laughs> but at any rate, um, and, and then they turn it over and they use it for, they do the herbs, they do it for everything in there. But anyway, so by the, all of this, by 1874, an annual production of shoes had hit a million dollars. Okay, now that's a lot of money for 1874. That'd be a lot of money for me right now. Um, <coughs> as Joanne mentioned, our development, our industrial development was downtown. So this is a straw factory that was on Elm Street. And straw, after shoes and boots, straw was our number two product, which I think Joe also mentioned, mostly for bonnets. This was the first time when women actually went to work in a factory. So they left home and they went to the factories. The shop had, at its peak, 125 employees. There were only 10 or 12 of them in the shop, but once again, they worked at home. And in 1857, we sh delivered 50,000 bonnets out of town. Well, by now, we're starting to pay attention to the fact that things can go elsewhere. This is the old nail factory, and if you look, I don't know how to use this little thing. How do I make the green dot? Well, anyway. See that building? <laughs> That's the Wilder building. Okay, all right. So, the Wilder building, right there, where the, what do you call it? The liquor store. The, yep, the new one, the beer thing. Craft, craft, thank you. Yep, and this would, this would be the site of where Bertucci's is. You, you know, it's been a number of different things, but we remembered it as Walter's Dairy for a long time. But, um, so the way <laughs> we want it back, yeah. <laughs> Okay, you can work on that. <laughs> I hope you have success, because I liked it too. Um, anyway, the Wilder Shop used to make the best pumps, you know, so they were here. When I moved in in 1966, they were still making, there was a small um, business going still that was the, the Wilder Pumps. We used to call it the pump shop. But anyway, um, other things that we had here in town that were for production, not just for our use, tortoiseshell combs. They were very popular. Women were wearing updos. And so we had tortoiseshell combs, barrels, boxes. I mean, it goes on. Nails, tack shop, and as Joanne mentioned, cranberries. And cranberries, the fun thing is we actually have a couple that are named after us. There was a Holliston berry and there's a Batchelder berry. And the Batchelder berry was for John or George? George. George Batchelder, who lived here. He was the one that hybridized it. They are, uh, the stock for those are actually down in Cranberry Land, and I do work for Cranberry Land, and that's the only reason I know this. Um, southeastern Massachusetts, they have the extension services down there, and the stock for those two varieties are still down there. They maintain them. So, jobs were plenty. This was the straw factory, one of them. Uh, where was Maury's? Maury's, how do you spell it? Maury's at, uh, Elm Street? Elm Street. Elm Street. Yeah. yeah, those are in prosperous days, but everybody looks... And they're all wearing straw hats, so clearly they're, you know, <laughs> following. <laughs> anyway, so then when you get to 1847 and the train finally comes, and not that this picture is from 1847, it was a lot of it was about product. It was about shipping freight more than it was about moving people. And as Joanne mentioned, late in the 1800s, the economy went downhill, and tax revenues were from farming rather than from industrial. And of course, that's not as lucrative. And so the industries started changing. This is the uh, shoe factory over on Water Street. Um, it's the, the opposite angle, but at any rate, it was the shoe factory. Um, there's lots of stories that go with this, and we'd take up the whole day if we did this, so we won't. Passengers, the last day of the commuter rail, I think it was 59 or 58. I said 59, but I didn't look it up. So 
Uh, Bobby Blair remembers his aunt taking him down there, dressing him all up, and getting him down there to go and see the last passenger train, the last commuter train. If any of you know Henry Delacker, I, I remember the story well that Henry moved here from Winchester because he could commute to Boston. And then about four years later, the train went away. <laughs> so that didn't work so well. I love this painting. This is the mid-50s in downtown Hollis. So it's done by a gentleman named Robert Moore. And um, it is a, it's available on prints and cards and stuff like that. But I love it because when I moved to Hollis, and this is basically what it looked like, and all the old cars and so forth, this is why, you know, I just really love this painting. So I stuck it in to say, this is when things started to transition. Now we were moving into cars, not trains, and we were moving into a bedroom community. Okay. Um, in the 1970s, we would see these little freight trains chugging on by. They would be going out toward Axton Cross or back and forth to downtown. Uh, you have to remember in the 1970s and 80s, you had state lumber, downtown. It brought in a lot of stuff on train. 1980s, that was the end. That was basically a, sometime in the mid to late 80s, I remember writing something for the newspaper about, I used to love to listen to the old whistle as the train would approach the, uh, the tunnel. You know, it would always blow the whistle. But it had that, it wasn't the screech that the electric whistles have, but that old steam toot however it was. I loved it. It was a mournful sound. But anyway, so in the 1990s, thanks to Robert and all of, uh, well, we have another one, Ken Anderson sitting right here, all his, wa Robert's cohorts in developing this trail and Herb Brockert and so forth. We're starting to turn into the trail town. And trail town, this whole image comes from Pennsylvania where they actually have a manual on how you can help your town become a trail town. And so why would you? Well, you want to try to capture the tourism that goes with it. And so you're probably sitting here saying, who the heck would go to Holliston for anything, OK? Other than to go to Fisk's. You know, why would you go there? <laughs> so the studies show, and this is true. This is true no matter where you read. And I read this stuff all the time. Doesn't matter where you are. If you have something that fits into a niche, you have potential. People today, young families especially, the people who have more money than I do, they pay for experiences. They're less about what they can buy. They can afford to go out and buy the oven, the stove, the whatever. But they pay for experiences. They pay for family activities. They want to see and do new things. They want to get out of their urban areas where they love their urban centers to live, but they like to get back to nature. And in Collison's case, we're pretty convenient and we have about 3,000 acres of land that we've set aside in open space. I was reading the old open space Hoosie Bobs from the mid-1900s, well, 1960-something or other, and they were saying we should set aside 25% of our land, and we have hit that. We have hit that. So we've got 3,000 acre, 3, acres of open land, which won't bring in any tax revenue with houses or with businesses or anything else. It's great, it was wonderful. We all like what it did for us. But it is never gonna pay its own way. So, Holliston Rail Trail comes along and I've created a slogan, come for a ride, play for the day. <laughs> uh, geocaching, it's basically think of hide and seek. You know, you hide something and some other group is gonna come and find it. I mean, it's a whole, anyway. We have ATV, all-terrain vehicle trails in West Holliston. Birding, guided walks, you could do all of these things, including the farms, um, in Holliston on a visit. Imagine it, plan to do it, okay. So imagine a more vibrant downtown where there were more activities going on there, more available. It's possible with septic management using communal systems in the village district. Industrial parks on the trail, tap into them. These are perks for businesses, you know. Work with the industrial parks. It's a perk for their employees. Partner with them on events and activities. What can we do with an artist col colony over at, uh, at the one on Water Street? You know, let's talk about what could expand there. With a the septic system solved, we even get restaurants. You can, in, tra in trail towns, they develop way signs to make sure that you know where everything is. So when you're, you get off the trail, you park your bike and you start walking, there's signage everywhere telling you how you get to Let's say the Poitras land, that little sign, the Poitras Conservancy in East Holliston, that connects to 1,100 acres of land, contiguous. 
okay? And you can walk from here, from there, all the way to the uh, Ashland Reservoir. You'll have to cross the street when you get to Ashland, but <laughs> you can get there, okay? Uh, Lake Winthrop and Stoddard Park, Goodwill Park, it's a feature because it is open to children with all kinds of abilities. Uh, it's a very special little park. Downtown, find ways to encourage people to do more. And I, I think it's you know, possible to do all of this. It's not going to be an overnight kind of thing, but the trail can improve the economy, bring new business, expand existing businesses, increase revenues to town in form of taxes and other benefits. And as a parting shot, I don't think we're done yet because this is the aerial view from Bing Photo, and this is the Eight Arch Bridge. Now, the bridge is going to look great, but I think that the area around it needs some attention. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is mine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> what? Let me talk in. <laughs> talk anyway. To my wife. <laughs> what, she doesn't like it? <laughs> uh, I, I got to get her permission. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's the end of it. <laughs> All right? You can all stand up and go and grab a drink of water or whatever. I think you have questions. Yeah, do you have yes, questions? questions? Yeah, we have a mic that can float around if you want to. Uh, yes, I'm a huge fan of Hallstone myself. I've been a Hallstonian ever since I came here, and uh, I just want to say, I just want to say, I can't wait to see the new bridge. It's going to be some really different improvement. But you know, being an eight-inch arch bridge fanatic myself. I mean, you know, and beyond, no, all those railway lines, I was sitting here thinking to myself, how does the train, how the train do it all in such a short amount of time? <laughs> but, you know, I just, and I just want to say thank you to Robert Wynick, Mrs. Greendale, Mrs. Holbert, and, and, Jay Robinson. And, and Jay Robinson, <laughs> for all the hard work. Thank you and have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. So Cullen. Cullen, Cullen's my neighbor, and I can tell you, Cullen, there will be no double yellow lines on the Eight Arch Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> we both live on Chamberlain Street, all right? Not happening. <laughs> that was the committee. That was the committee that got you into trouble. Yeah. There you go, Karen. Hi, Karen. Yes, I, um, I had a question about the <laughs> Hi. Um, I had a question with the um, invitation of development and tourism and everything else. Um, there's also some associated growing pains or even problems or something. I guess we have to keep in mind that sort of active management of these trails. Mm -hmm. Right now they kind of police themselves and they're, you know, there's always the 1% that's going to mess things up. So are there thoughts toward active management of the trails and the conservation areas and the you have Other to remember that this is nothing more than Mary Greendale saying that this is possible, okay? <laughs> and in terms of are there thoughts, sure. I mean, if you, if you look at what other towns have faced, yeah, they've all had to deal with all of that. It's just a preamble. It's just a let's start thinking about it because revenue sources are limited. We're not going to become an industrial complex by any stretch of the imagination. So what can we do to maintain our quality of life without giving up too much of it? So, yeah. The other thing you have to think about is that Robert's going to get tired someday. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but, you know, seriously, we're relying on volunteers to do what towns typically do. You know, developing things like that and rail protecting them and managing them and cleaning them and cleaning up and emptying trash and cutting down trees when the trees fall and that kind of stuff. So, any other questions? Um, just your personal view. Do you see ourselves like a Concord downtown, or never that, like a never, Shelburne never Falls? Like that. I think I think more of a Shelburne Falls kind of thing. You know, um, it, it never lost its identity, even when there are a thousand people there for one day to look at the flowers. You know, it never it never got that big, um, but they've managed it. They've managed it. I don't think we have enough here to attract to be a Concord. You know, I mean, there aren't aren't that many things to go to, but I think. Uh, yeah, Shelburne Falls. Bobby talked about doing a bridge of flowers. 
and then then we got off of that. We got off of that. <laughs> yeah. Every, then the, then there were all kinds of reasons that we weren't going to do that. But there are ways to you know beautify that area around that arch. Yes. Oh, there you go, little Bobby. There was a lady over here. Yes. Up, up, stand up, stand. Hi. <laughs> I think what you're doing, proposing for the trail is great and that will bring in a lot of people. Has that been taken into consideration with the traffic downtown and with the new plans down there? <laughs> As I said, this is nothing more than a, a beginning. You know, so all of those questions have to be answered. There's no committee to, that's been set up to study this or anything else like that. This is just, you know, kicking off an idea. That's all. And obviously, d traffic, if they're coming on a bike, they're not going to be any problem to us, right? They're <laughs> oh, no, the bicycles. Not, not the kind with the motors. You don't allow motors on the, on the trail, although we do have one visitor who stops by with a little bike with a motor. But um, yeah, no, they were, you know, for the most part, this is, this is low, low level traffic kind of thing. Some years ago, someone went in and nicely cleared out between the road there at Woodland Street and the bridge. Um, it's now pretty much grown back, as has the, the part on the other side. But with all the re conservation restrictions, you talked about clearing up around it. Will that be possible? There's a management plan for that. Um, Barbara Briggs. Briggs designed a management plan four years ago. And that's already gone to the Conservation Commission. Um, one of the issues is that you have s two slopes coming off of the bridge on either end uh, to very steep pitches. There's nothing there that holds that. There's, you know, so we need some erosion protection there. Um, we have a lot of poison ivy down there um, and that we've got to get rid of. So there is a management plan and has gone through the Conservation Commission. And yeah, it will be taken care of. And the people who cleared it were the highway department. They're, they go in once a year um, in June, probably, uh, to try to clear it out. A couple of us, we grew up in the neighborhood there, the original orchards in town. Yeah. And when I was listening to the history about the train, um, I would have been a, a real young kid in the 50s there. But I know for a fact, in the early 60s, you used to have a lot of the um, men that would stop at the top of, um, you had Norland and Regal, and then you have a circle up there. The train would stop for the men. My dad was one of them. He was working for Boston Edison. And I know we had Mr. Janes, and you had a lot of them that worked for insurance companies in Boston. And they would be running in their suits to catch the train, and then they would go on into Boston. No kidding. Yeah. That's cool. That was one of the things. And then I remember a lot of us, we used to go playing up on the, uh, on the bridge. And that's how a lot of us used to get into trouble because we're always told you don't go there and play. And your brother used to be the leader. <laughs> <laughs> and and there, there, there is evidence there on several pictures uh, that came from my family archives yeah. you know, that have to do with the bridge. And yes, guilty as charged. Yeah. <laughs> I really like it when uh, we have stories on the, uh, there's a, a Facebook page for the Eight Arch Bridge and kids, people have talked about when they were kids they threw pennies down and then they would say after the rain, the train would run over right, and yeah. swishled it. You know, yeah. They, yeah. they would save those. Yes. Other people who would try to get across the, the tracks when the train was coming. This was another game yes, I'm sure every right, mother yeah. and father yeah, loved. Last one across, it was last, called. Oh, yeah, last, last one, one across. across. Yeah. <laughs> Just to follow up on, on your comment, uh, my father when we moved here, I think, in 32. He commuted to Boston for, I forget how long, up into the 50s. Uh, and you can, if you look at the timetable, I believe you'll find that you could, they could get from the depot here to South Station in an hour. And I don't think you can do that today. Good point. Yeah, a good point. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for putting on this presentation. 
Um, I just wanted to make a comment that um, it's wonderful to see this, and I hope that some of the young people in town realize what a well-seasoned group here is looking out for their future. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, uh, there we go. Thanks. I'm from Milford, but um, I'm not ashamed to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and we're happy to have you. Congratulations on all the work you've done on this. It is wonderful. I have walked the Holliston Trail, too. Oh. But the Milford one is, is, has been paved, and my daughter likes the Holliston one better because it's dirt. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, like the reason Milford is, it's handicap accessible, and we receive more grants because it is and I have seen three or four wheelchairs, even one man with a wheelchair and a dog, <laughs> going along the Upper Charles Trail. Mm -hmm, so I nice. do appreciate our trail. And I'm glad they're combined because it makes a really nice walk. Yeah. It's great. And it's the fantastic. other yeah. thing is um, Milford Pink Granite. That eight arch bridge is Milford Pink Granite. Yeah. And I'm a quarry lover. I have led tours five times around the different quarries in Milford. Huh. And so I appreciate the fact that it is being uh, repaired. And you call it the jewel. That's funny because we call Memorial Hall where we have our meetings the jewel. Yeah, it's but a beautiful thank hall. Thank you too. very much for the presentation. Uh, one thing I want to mention about Milford uh, that, uh, for everybody to keep in mind is that if you find that you have to walk to Milford from Holliston, go by the rail trail. It's much, much shorter than going by the street. And that was well known because back in the 1860s and 70s and even in the 50s, um, the Catholic parishioners, before there was St. Mary's Church here in Holliston, would have to get to Milford for Mass. And they walked the railroad line, not the road, because they also knew that it was the shortest distance between the two points. So if you've got to go to Milford, and it's not that long a walk actually, Go by way of the rail trail, <laughs> as they did. <laughs> thank you, folks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. A quick thank you and call out to Leslie. Thank you for opening the library for us. Seriously, you're wonderful.